Hi, everyone. I'm Rick Benson. You are. Today is Tuesday, March 15th. Welcome to this week's In the Know Trader show. We've got the S&P up a substantial 53 points right now as we record late morning. Uh, we're seeing oil get hit again. It's down over $8 this morning and is currently under $95 a barrel. That is down from $130 a barrel just last week. And that is giving uh, the market finally a lift. And uh, let's see, we've got Bitcoin at about 39,000, give or take. The dollar's uh, just down a touch today. Gold getting hit hard, uh, down about $44 or so. Um, and the US 10 year is at 212, that's down about one and a half basis points after being down at under 2.08 earlier today, it's back up to 212. So uh, we've got markets moving, we've got a Fed with a meeting tomorrow that's certainly potentially uh, could set the pace. Now at this point, we're pretty sure uh, that Chairman Powell is going to raise rates by only 25 basis points. He all but, well, he did tell us last week that that is what he is supporting when uh, he spoke to a, a Senate hearing committee. Uh, it's extremely uh, atypical for a Fed chairman to uh, tell us what they're going to do before they're going to do it. Certainly, if you're old enough to think back to Alan Greenspan days, um, he was the master of double talk and said virtually nothing and let on nothing. So this is a very different Fed chairman uh, who's got to manage both uh, retiring a balance sheet that the Fed's balance sheet is way too large. At the same time, uh, he doesn't want to raise rates too much, but they certainly need to raise rates. And this is, you know, you've got inflation running rampant. It's just, and you've got the Russia-Ukraine situation. So he's got a very uh, difficult task in front of him and how many times he's going to raise rates this year. The street is betting anywhere from five to, I think, 11, I heard. Um, which it sounds like an absurd amount, but um, markets are at least getting some bounce today. And it's good to see after all the pain uh, we've, we've seen essentially since the beginning of January. So in this week's show, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of scaling in and out of positions. In our market overview section, we'll take a look at the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average ETF, the diamonds as they're known as, ticker DIA. Uh, the U.S. 10-year and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index ETF, because that has moved sharply higher and then uh, taken a quick little dive uh, over the last week or so. Last week, uh, my intent was getting to the sector ETFs. We only got to a few of them. So this week, I'll make sure we have time to get through all of them. And I'll even start from the last one, EWM, and work our way backwards on the list, because last week, we did get to the first three or four or something like that. Um, so I just want to make sure that we try to give you as much information and uh, across all these ETFs as we can. As uh, president and in the new trader, it is my duty uh, and pleasure to also tell you about that we have a weekly ETF tactical trader report generally comes out Thursday nights. Uh, in this report, we go through the whole macro picture of the market, what's going on in bonds, uh, gold, the dollar, uh, credit spreads, uh, and a deep dive into the S&P. Uh, I give you a new ETF trading idea each week, and you can sign up for that at inthenotrader.com. I think we are finally at the point that in less than one week, we will have the brand new website up. Uh, it is replacing older software and out-of-date software. Um, and uh, so we're really looking forward to the launch of the new website. And again, hopefully uh, that gets done in a week. And so that next week when we have the show, I can be telling you about the new website. We also produce a piece that comes out monthly on the last day of the month. It's called the 7-Eleven Report. Its goal is to outperform the S&P by being in no more than seven of the 11 spider sector ETFs at any one time. Um, so that uh, with the goal of uh, to staying away from the underperforming sectors. Um, and instead of just simply buying spiders uh, with five minutes of work a month, 
Uh, you can adjust a portfolio that we allocate to uh, that you can do yourself. In the month of February, we outperformed by 82 BIPs. In our fiscal year, which starts every August 1st, we're up by 2.22% over the S&P in the same time. And since we started doing this 19 months ago, we are outperforming the S&P by 5.67%. That puts us in the top 10% of all money managers out there. So we are not actually managing your money, but telling you how to allocate so that you handle the actual movement in and out. And we don't do a lot of portfolio um, shifting, but hey, if you can outperform by five and a half percent in 19 months, you are a star. Um, so if you want information about how you can subscribe to that, go to inthenotrader.com. Let's take a look at the macro sector relative performance. So these are the 11 um, spider ETFs that we play with each month. On the far left is the actual spider itself, down over 12% year to date. Um, and you can see that it is solely the energy sector that is the only one outperforming and largely outperforming. Now it's going to give back, um, and it, it gave back about 300 basis points of outperformance in the last week or so, because if I remember correctly, last week it was over. 37% higher, um, and now it's up only 34% and change, but everything else is down on the year. But of course, utilities is the best performing of the, of the ones that are down. So you know, in relative terms, it's still outperforming. Financials continue to outperform. Uh, staples and industrials are your main outperformers. Even materials have outperformed, but not by much. The, the, the worst sectors are on the left side there, consumer discretionary. Uh, communication services and technology all doing quite poorly. Um, so let's talk for a few minutes, and then I don't think it's going to be more than that, but just about this idea of the pros and cons of scaling in and out of positions. So given the volatility that we have in the marketplace now, the question I'll pose to you is, do you really think, and, and this is not uh, rhetorical per se, do you really think you could be that good to pick a single entry point to get into an idea that you want to get long and to pick one and only one exit point to get out? Essentially, you're doing all or nothing, right? When you trade that way, you get in in one price, you get out at one price. That basically means that you need to be perfect on both ends or darn close to it. Otherwise, you're giving up a bunch of money. And what I would suggest is that in a market that is as volatile as we're seeing now, it is virtually impossible to pick one and only one place, nail the bottom to a move such that you don't have some decent drawdown. And then when you decide to sell, you sell at one and only one price and you get out without seeing that stock ETF or whatever it is that you're trading still trade higher such that um, you know, a couple of days from now, you could have made more if you'd stayed in or not sold all of it. And um, I will suggest to you that this is a perfect environment to scale in and scale out of positions. Uh, and when I mean scale, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, it means use multiple entry and multiple exit um, prices and, and trades. And because you pay nothing for commission these days, um, you should be trading for free. Every platform out there lets you trade for free. And if you are paying commission to trade stocks uh, or ETFs, you are foolishly wasting money. Uh, so find yourself a platform and you don't have to look far, whether it's, uh, well, I'm not even going to list them. Every single platform out there, you can trade for free. Uh, so make sure you are. And therefore, there's no extra cost to putting in multiple orders at multiple prices the way you used to have to. Uh, be more conscious of the commission cost built into the cost of trading. Now you don't. So there's no reason that if let's say, I'm just making up something here. Let's say you were looking to get out of a stock at uh, 37 and a half dollars. Well, yeah, you could put an offer to sell all your shares at 37 and a half, but you could, if what happens if it gets to 37.49 peaks and, and go straight down? You're going to be happy that you, you had an order in at 37 and a half and you missed it by a penny. Um, so I think given the volatility and the difficulty and even precise levels holding, 
you scale out of that trade. So instead of selling, let's say, 100 shares at 37 and a half, you sell perhaps um, use every 10 cents away and start scaling, you know, from 50 cents lower to 50 cents higher. If that's too wide a range, then, then you know, sell 25 shares um, every 10 cents either side. Whatever way you want to do it, I just think you need to use multiple orders to get in and out. So at least, you know, you get some done instead of potentially getting nothing done and or potentially getting filled. You feel great that you got filled. And two days later, the stock's, you know, $3 higher. So I think I, I look at ranges now. Um, when we look at the um, charts, uh, actually, let's say, we'll look at the GSG. Um, we'll look at why you, it's, it's much better to use multiple orders and to scale in and scale out because um, the markets are moving very, very volatile with, with high volatility now. And it's just not easy to pick that one price uh, to do things at. So let's say if, if you've been long, the energy sector for a while and obviously it's come off and today it's off again hard but over the last few days i've been selling some energy names that i've had in my portfolio i didn't pick one day one price um and the fact that i'm selling it today it's lower i'm not saying gee if i had sold it all yesterday it would have been better yeah i would have been if i look at this as this is the absolute peak and it's never going higher um or at least not in the near term and, and I think of that too, when I get into a position, often I'll find, if I can find a confluence of support levels that are fairly near each other, I'll be bidding against each one of those levels to get into my full position. But I'm not just going to pick one and potentially have to deal with a week or two of drawdown before it makes its final low, um, you know, before I can finally um, then decide if it's still something I want. So. Um, today's quick education is to think about scaling in and out of positions, especially given the environments we're in now, we're making one decision, um, really puts you at an all or nothing type of situation versus getting in and out. And, and I've said for, uh, several weeks now that, uh, given what credit spreads have done and given what the market's done. I mean, it's no surprise that we're bouncing now. We actually have downside exhaustion signals uh, uh, across multiple major indexes. So the fact that the S&P, which is now up 63 points on the day, um, is up like we're seeing today is not a big surprise given what oil's doing and given the downside exhaustion signals. But there isn't just one place that I've you know been buying recently. And on the way... As, as we start getting towards resistance, I will scale out because there are multiple levels of resistance in the major stock indexes. I'm not going to know which one is going to be the one and only one that it, it stalls at for good and potentially sells off again. So I need to do this in pieces so that as we hit resistance, I take some off. But I also allow for the fact that this could be a bigger rally. And, you know, we had higher and, and there's plenty of resistance levels mid-range between uh, all-time highs that we saw, let's say, in the uh, first week in January and um, wh where we just got down to. So um, I'm, I'm doing things in pieces and I'm smart enough to know that no one's going to know exactly the one time only to get in and the one time only to get out. All right, let's take a look at some charts. Here you go. All right, so here's the uh, Dow Industrial Average on a weekly chart. So we have our first this week set up nine count against prior lows from June. So there is support here. Um, so no surprise if we if this stalls here and we get some type of bounce. But on a bounce, take a look at simply the level from the baseline to the conversion line, which includes the top of the cloud over the next few weeks, there should be some pretty stiff resistance here. I don't think we just simply turn around, scoot higher, and then go to all-time highs the way the perma bulls are telling you that we're likely to do this year. Can we bounce from here? Absolutely. But 
this is not a uh, gimme trade as if we are in the same environment we've been in the past because A, we have a war to deal with that affects the entire global economy. Secondly, and very importantly, you have a Fed that's no longer accommodative, right? We know rates are going higher. The market can deal with higher rates, but whereas in the past, the you knew with an accommodative Fed that was always going to put money into the system, even if you didn't have a perfectly timed buy, it was only a matter of time before the market was going to come back your way. So you didn't have to worry so much about if your timing was precise because the bull market was alive and well. It's much more questionable whether the bull market is alive and well. Look across NASDAQ, which peaked a year ago in breath terms, it has been a disaster. And many names are down 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent in a year. Um, there is going to be overhead supply from people who are caught higher. And even though the S&P is down far less than what the Nasdaq's been down, there's going to be overhead supply. Um, so with credit spreads, which may very well be coming in today, I'm not sure, I, uh, I haven't looked, but um, credit spreads have been on their widest levels of the move coming into today. It's very hard to think that, you know, we just turn around and make new all-time highs the way you'll see several people on the business TV networks telling you. Um, of course, they've been telling you to buy all the way down too. So uh, for the uh, six, 700 S&P points that we've been falling, they've been telling you to buy also. To me, I just can't give a lot of credence to permables. Uh, everybody knows historically that the market goes up. So telling me that you're bullish doesn't really help me a heck of a lot, honestly. All right, what's next? After diamonds, let's take a look at the US 10 year. So inverted head and shoulders, right? Here's the left shoulder. Here's the whole bottoming head. Here's the right hand shoulder. We break out. We stall against the setup nine up. Look at the weekly nine counts in the TNX. The all time bottom, weekly nine down. Near the high of the move, weekly nine up into a nine down into a nine up, pulls back, makes a new high, nine up, pulls back. Now we're on a 13 also. So that's going to make it harder to go play for rates to move up now. Um, and I've got two upside targets that I've talked about this year is 215, 216 in yield terms. Two, in other words, 2.15, 2.16, right? A few basis points above where we are now. And then two and a half percent. Those are my target levels. Um, and so we'll see, even with this big jump up here now, is this going to stall in here and pull back? Um, or is this the beginning of the next move? And it's, it's harder for me to play it right now, staring at a weekly 13, knowing that um, it's, you know, You've got a Fed coming out tomorrow. If the Fed surprises in any way that's negative, um, you could see rates make a very quick move. And, um, and same thing with stocks. If they, if they surprise and they cut a half uh, instead of a quarter now, you're going to see today's gains disappear very quickly. Uh, so, you know, today we could easily end up 90, 100 points higher, even more. Um, the signals are all there for that to happen. The question is, will it stay or not? But at least for short term right now, yes, we, we have a bounce and, and um, it's a bounce you can play with tight stops underneath. Let's take a look at the GSG and then we'll get to our um, country charts. So here we go. Here's the weekly chart of um, the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index. First, I'm going, to, I'm going to take the cloud chart down. So this, if you look at where this green horizontal line is, this caught, this was lows back in 2015. We broke beneath it. We came back to it in 2018. And now we finally broke out. So we have a good, you know, kind of long-term bottom in place. The bottom, the absolute bottom was March 2020, or I guess it was April 2020. This is the COVID low when this whole secular bull uh, move started. So both a cyclical and my guess a secular bull. We just topped out. And here's where also taking uh, partial profits or selling into strength matters. Um, one of the other podcasts I did 
Last week, we talked about taking profits between 24 and a half and 25 and a half to at least sell some. We were in the fifth wave um, of an Elliott wave move up and we hit targets as measured by those, you know, these are two different target levels measured by wave heights. And you can see we got to the very top end of this range and now we are down here at 21. So off of a high of last week at 26, uh, we're trading at 21 in small change. You know, demonstrable decline uh, in just a week. We, we've taken back much of the two weeks ago, a huge move up. And, um, you know, now you look for some type of ABC correction before potentially putting in another leg to the secular market, uh, bull market. But right now, you know, commodities are under pressure. And it's a matter of trying to figure out where you come back into this uh, if you're looking for commodities to still make a bigger move over time. I generally am. Um, and, you know, it's probably somewhere down in here from anywhere from this green line on maybe down to these lows here near 16. Somewhere in there is probably the place to consider doing some buying as this longer term bottom is in place. Um, but this is, you know, you, you had to at least take some off as we got there. And that is what I had recommended. And in hindsight, now you might say, gee, I wish took it all off. But you might have said that anywhere along the way in this rally that you wish you had taken it all off and you were right for a week or two and wrong for the bigger picture. So unless you think you're that good that you can always call the highs and the lows, scale in and scale out in an environment like this. Okay, let's get to the uh, country sector charts. We're going to start with Australia, EWA, and work our way backwards on the list. Um, so here we went to the propulsion exhaustion level on the way down. This is bounce. Now remember, Australia tends to be a commodity-oriented type of stock market because it's it's a it's a resource rich um country so this is not going to be nearly as bad as some of the other charts we look at that were you know let's say the s p where you you know we were just on the lows for this move this is well higher um but now up into some resistance so need to take that into consideration you really got to get above let's say uh top of the cloud here to make me think that this can test the highs that we saw back from last year EWY. All right, so here's South Korea. Very important point, simply, you know, pure downtrend since uh, almost a year now, uh, 13 pretty much on the highest, lagging line right against the bottom of the cloud. So there is some support right here. If this can hold, you get a quick move up to 71-ish, which is almost 5%. Um, this is important level. If this breaks with any bit of significance, next move down, gets you to 61 and change, that's 10% lower. EWU, the United Kingdom, all right? So this is um, the UK's chart for their uh, predominant stocks. Look at the you know, 13s. This, of course, is not near all-time highs the way the, the US made all-time highs this year. We have to go back to, looks like 2014 to find all-time highs. Um, so very different looking market, but as we look here, um, we are holding against a propulsion downside level. So that is holding now three weeks in a row, some resistance up here towards the top of the cloud and 32.81 ish or so where the, the conversion of baselines are, um, you really have to get above, I'd say this level here, 36 to put, fully put this back into, you know, really solid bull market territory. Otherwise the downside You've got 32 and a half and in a really bad situation, 27 and change. EWW, similar looking chart, but a little more strength because we, we're still holding on to the top of the cloud. So even though the 13s have been good from calling sideways action for almost a year, um, this is showing strength. So uh, Mexico here is one of the better looking charts of this. Um, let's look at, uh, da, 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 what do we have? EWH. So this is Hong Kong. Now this is, you know, affected somewhat by China and, uh, and you know, the tech wreck going on there now. Um, this has been above and below the clouds. So that's not even that helpful. We're on a 12 count here. I'd say if you, you got a bottom fish, you go for somewhere between, I don't know, 19 to 20 or so. Tough, tough thing to do now with the politics involved there. Germany, EWG. 
nine count like the U.S. has. Uh, um, if this is perfected because last week our aid was lower than six and seven's low. So uh, lagging line holds against bottom of the cloud. If this shoots up, look for resistance first at the bottom of the cloud, as well as where the lagging line would hit its top cloud. So somewhere, you know, 31, 32-ish is going to be uh, second resistance. First resistance is going to be up here near the 25. I kind of like how this is looking that it's hold, holding on to uh, the level that it needs to in the near term. That's my little warning sign that we are out of time. So between last week and this week, we did get to, I think, all of these. Hopefully that helps you and uh, think about scaling in and out when we have a market like this. I'm Rick Benson. You are. Thanks for listening to In The No Trader. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.